Welcome to the CSUDH Community Forum with President Thomas Parham. My name is Kara Furman and I will be your MC for today's event. This conversation and check-in for the CSUDH community will begin with opening remarks from Dr. Parham. And then after the opening remarks, the focus will be on specific topics related to fall 2020 and beyond and will be open for questions. And before we get started, let's review some housekeeping rules. Once the forum is open for questions and answers, if you would like to ask a question or offer a comment, please raise your hand. The questions will be answered or addressed in the order received. If you have a mic, you'll be quote unquote offered the mic to ask your question. If you're calling in on a phone, the process is still gonna be the same. If you don't have a mic um, or you're not comfortable speaking um, in the forum, you can put your questions or comments in the question and answer section. And any questions that are outside the scope of the town hall will be forwarded to the Office of the President at csudh.edu. And now I present to you Dr. Par Thomas Parham, President of the California State University, Dominguez Hills. Dr. Parham? Thank you, Kara. And uh, let me add my voice to the chorus of those that will say welcome to all of you again. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, for joining us in this important occasion. Uh, as a regular town hall. And ironically, I'd rather be holding this in person and hosting you on our beautiful campus, uh, but because of the circumstance, we are unable to do so today. So this virtual reality will have to uh, do. So for those I've not had the pleasure of meeting, I am Dr. Thomas Parham, the 11th president of California State University, Dominguez Hills. And this extraordinary campus that I happen to be the president of is really a space shared by some remarkable administrators, uh, terrific faculty, uh, magnificent staff, and about 17,000 students uh, who call this the Toro Nation and they call it home. So joining me today on the call, I want to introduce you to a few of my colleagues who uh, do the work. A president, ladies and gentlemen, is really only as good as the work produced by the people who work with them. And so I am surrounded by a magnificent team. First of all, uh, let me let you say hello to our provost, who is a big fancy word that means he's our chief academic officer. And that's Dr. Michael Spagna. Dr. Spagna, you want to wave your hand and say hello to our folks? Hi, everybody. Welcome. And uh, uh, to my left in my screen, this looks like Hollywood Squares, uh, I'm joined by our terrific uh, Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. William Franklin. Dr. Franklin, say hello to the peeps. Nice to see you. I'm Thank also you. joined by uh, our Vice President for Information Technology. So everything technology-wise uh, is driven by what he does. So let me introduce you to Vice President Chris Manriquez. Chris? Hello. Uh, and also want to make sure you have a chance to meet these two individuals because uh, they staff me and support me and I try to support them and all the efforts they do to really make this university look good. And these are the folk who work out of government relations and external relations for the campus. And they're just two magnificent assets we have on campus. So first of all, I want you to say hello to David Gamboa. So David, say hello to the folk. Good afternoon, everyone. And I want you to say hello to the soon to be, uh, we are so proud of her, uh, Dr. Kalia Bradshaw. Kalia, say hello to the people. Hey, everyone. So nice to see you. And finally, we're joined by uh, my chief of staff. So she serves as kind of my right hand, left hand. That's uh, Deborah Robertson. Deborah, you want to say hello to the people? Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> so now that you've met other members of the team, and I'll have a chance to introduce other members uh, as they join us for the call, uh, let me move through my remarks. What I'd like to do during our time this evening is lay out, I think, uh, a summary of some of the fall planning elements that are going on on campus and have you hear about those. What we wanna do is leave the majority of the time for you to ask questions and answers as a community of um, residents, community of business leaders, community of alumni, and just strategic and engaged stakeholders who very much care about what goes on on the campus. So again, I say welcome and let's get into the rest of the uh, meeting. So, you know, at California State University, Dominguez Hills, it continues to evolve and prosper as an educational institution. 
and more than ever, we are, as I say, transforming lives that ultimately transform America. Even as our communities are really convulsed and really devastated by the continuing challenges of racial injustice in this country. So we've got to open, I think, with a call uh, and a message, I think, for that and to bring you up to speed on where we have been with that. As I indicated in the message that I've sent to the campus community, and I said this very clearly to them, that the social justice roots that this university was founded on run very deep in the campus's DNA. Yet, if we become passive spectators to our history, instead of active participants in actualizing the full promise and possibility of our educational mission to challenge bias and assumption, confront bigotry and prejudice, eradicate cultural ignorance, and help students, staff, and faculty realize a greater measure of their common humanity, then we have not completely fulfilled the legacy that we have been blessed to inherit. And so I want to open with that remark uh, and let you know that we are very serious about our social justice roots, and that is in the fabric of our DNA. And we have been very clear, I think, and very pointed in some of the messages there. For those of you interested in reading the full measure of that message, you can find it. It's titled, From Tragedy to Transformation, Thoughts on Confronting Racism. And that message can be found on the president's office webpage. Uh, in, uh, from the desk of the president section is what it says in the uh, heading. I'm also hosting, or have hosted, I should say, a virtual town hall on the same thing, bringing together over 600 members of the campus community. And this forum uh, held a little over a week ago, gave students, staff, and faculty an opportunity to voice uh, their concerns and for their voices just to be heard and to talk through what were the pressing issues. And it provided a forum simply for the community of the Toro Nation just to cathart and talk about how they felt about that, but also to challenge us as an administration, to challenge us as a faculty to move forward and see what more we might be able to do to be able to resolve some of the schism that exists in the country now and, and, and really heal the rupture and, 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 and extend the splendor of what we want to do in terms of coming together as a common humanity. So why is that important? Because our university's mission and values at California State University of Dominguez Hills was founded upon, right? Just as critical now as they were back then some 60 years ago. So the campus as it was relocated uh, from Rolling Hills Estates and Palos Verdes into the Dominguez Ranch into the city of Carson, right? In the present location, in part in a response to city fathers who were working back then, the Gil Smiths of the world in response to the Watch Rebellion in response to the governor uh, intervening. I mean, there are a confluence of factors that really led us to this goal, but all of it was to provide an educational foundation that would uplift and advance our society and provide a gateway and a door of opportunity for the residents of the urban core, both of South Los Angeles as well as the South Bay region. And so we are pleased that we are continuing in that mission. So our core mission remains the same in providing our students with outstanding education, teaching skills, enhancing knowledge that then uplifts the surrounding community. And as vital economic and educational resources we're always mindful of the commitment we have to the region. And we also take ownership and responsibility for the social justice that we owe to our diverse student population. Now, you'll also remember that we are a federally designated minority serving institution. So approximately 85% of our student body are from underrepresented minority groups. Just think about that a minute. 85% of our student body is from underrepresented minority groups. 65% of our students are the first in their families to go to college, 65%. Why is that important? Because the degree that our students uh, earn provide opportunities for social and economic mobility throughout the community. Having a college education is one of the greatest right, avenues to enhance social mobility that I know about in my lifetime. And the fact that we're able to provide that for so many students I think for us is a badge of honor that we take very seriously. We would also say that we cannot advance the region 
without a relationship between this university and our dedicated partners. What we do does not happen in a vacuum. So I want to express our gratitude to all of the community stakeholders, both those that have joined us today, as well as those that are out there who are unable to be with us, because you are partners from both local, regional, and business arenas, because you have been just steadfast in your ongoing support and partnership and commitment to this university we call Cal State Dominguez Hills. Now, I also want to recognize and thank our community members and alumni who provide their time, their talent, and their treasures to our university by serving on university advisory boards, university support groups, or contribute to our university in meaningful and substantial ways. You're critically important to the continued progress and success of this campus, and I simply want to say thank you again for all that you have done. Now, there's some of you who currently aren't involved. Let me see you raise your hands virtually. If you aren't involved, but feel like you want to be, we have a solution for you. So there are great opportunities that exist for you on campus. And we would appreciate really your expertise in getting involved with us. So I want you to connect with David Gambos. One of the reasons why I introduced you to him early on, on the call, is that he's our Associate Vice President for External Relations. And he can find ways to help you get involved and he can be reached, I'm going to give you his number, his area code 310, and the number is 243-3819. Let me say that again. 310-243-3819. Oh, David, do I have that right? Carol, unmute David for me. You do, President Parham. That's correct. Good, good. Absolutely. And so I want you to be, be sure to connect with him because we can find ways to get you connected to all the wonderful things that are going on here on the campus. And we really need your energy, your vitality, your strength, your character, your treasures. We need all of that to help this university grow. This is your university in the community. Now, I also know that today we're joined by many of our alumni. And you know, we have this expression. So let me see the horns up. Once a Toro, always a Toro. So we got the horns up here. And so you embody our university's values and transcend and advance our mission right, as critical contributors to a global workforce. So we want to say welcome to you and really express again our pride in all that you do and will continue to do in the future. So even during this pandemic, there is much happening at California State University of Dominguez Hills and keeping our community informed and connected allows for continued progress. So let me see if we can't give you some visual representation about what we've been doing. So I'd like to share with you, first of all, the latest news about our university amid the current health crisis and what lies ahead for our institution and the campus community. So what are we doing relative to fall planning? So after broad consultation, a fall planning and beyond document has been developed. So this has provided us with a framework to move forward with our planning while simultaneously aligning our final decisions with what the California State University system will do. So summer classes and fall 2020 classes will be conducted through alternate remote learning, principally virtual in orientation. And I say principally because some of our classes will be online, some of them will be Zoom, some of them will be synchronous, asynchronous, and there'll be a very limited number with exception that'll be done face-to-face. -face. If you have more questions about that, the person who's our expert guru on that is our provost, Mike Spagna, which is why I wanted to make sure you had a chance to meet him at the beginning of this phone call. So also in consultation with campus stakeholders, including our students, faculty, and staff, we've established what is a fall 2020 recovery committee. And that will assist us during this next phase, ensuring that the core mission of education and student success continues to be met during these challenging times. We cannot stop what the university wants to do in supporting our students. We simply have to right, adjust to the adaptations we are all being required to make given this health crisis. Now, we are guided by a set of principles. At the top of that list 
is the need to protect the health and safety of our campus community. And we do that as best we can. And that'll remain, I think, paramount in our approaches. So as we think about prevalence, right, and incidence data of COVID-19 cases, the availability of testing and tracing equipment for personnel, the ability to uh, acquire sufficient PPE equipment, the capacity to maintain a clean, sanitized, and disinfected environment, right, and other factors, all of that will help inform our thinking and final decisions moving forward. The capacity for the campus to move fully online, of course, is a challenging proposition at best. Uh, Mr. Provost, as you see him shaking his head, yes, like it is challenging to be sure. And so- but we're, up, we're up for the challenge. We are up for the challenge, absolutely. And not only are, is it a challenge, I think, just because of the virtual environment and the technological innovations that are required, but being a resource-constrained institution means that we don't have sufficient resources, nor do we have uh, uh, sufficient infrastructure in some cases to be able to do that. So we've had to take a good hard look at what it is we need to do, which is why all of these experts that you see uh, on this call have been sitting in meetings uh, sometime twice a day for a couple hours, sometime on the weekends for the last several months, literally working on behalf of this entire community to make sure that we could do it as safely as possible and deliver a first in class experience, right? for online instructional delivery, as well as technological innovations that allow our students to be able to avail themselves of the opportunities that we will have presented. Also, we're currently evaluating our student housing situation, that housing reports to Dr. Franklin, who you met. So at this point, I can tell you that the availability of on-campus housing will be severely limited and will require meeting very rigorous thresholds for physical distancing. So, I can't imagine what that exactly will look like, but if we have 647 bed spaces in our apartment style, we will have a fraction of those folk, maybe 20%, maybe no more than 30 in that space, depending on right, the needs of our particular students. I should also mention, by the way, that in that student cohort, we have uh, some students who are homeless, some students who are uh, guardian scholars connected to foster care, some folk who come from distances away that commuting is not an option. And if we have any element of face-to-face -face instruction, they'll need to have some place to live. But we'll have to navigate that space very carefully um, in making sure that we are able to meet their needs and maintain health and safety. So one of the people who is leading that effort for us in making sure we can manage our space, making sure that everything is clean, disinfected, making sure all our facilities are tight, our budget is tight, I want to have a chance to meet uh, Vice President Deborah Wallace, who's one of the newest members of our team. And I think she's joined us. Let's see if we can unmute Deborah Wallace's phone and have her say hello to the community that she may not have met yet. Oh, there good you evening. are. Good evening, everyone. So glad to be on the call this evening. Thank you, Deborah. Nice to see you. And so she's uh, one of the people, along with our medical experts, who will be ensuring that we have uh, all the required prerequisites necessary to make sure we have the social distancing, PPE equipment, spaces being disinfected to make sure that we can protect the health and safety of everybody in our campus community, both our students, our faculty, as well as our staff who work, some of which on a daily basis, as well as those who commute. Now, in addition, right, to the health and safety of our student athletes, all athletic competition has been suspended indefinitely. Hard decision to make for those of us that are more athletically uh, uh, inclined and, and certainly want to support our athletes, but we have to protect the health and safety of those young men and women. And so that includes competition, it includes practice, it includes training, and it includes travel. So those things are all suspended until further notice. However, while those elements of, of, of the athletic competition, training, uh, travel, and uh, practice are suspended, the aspect of them being a part of a team, we still want to be able to support and enhance. So we are doing everything that we can to make sure that those activities will continue right under the support and guidance of our very capable uh, head and assistant coaches who are connected to them. We should also say that in addition to what goes on in the classroom, probably 30, 40, maybe 50% of what a student will learn in their college career, they will learn outside of the four walls of the classroom in what we call co-curricular ways. And so all co-curricular activity, including 
a whole range of student services, theater arts activities, such as plays and concerts, campus forums, campus meetings, guest speaker lectures will either be postponed or held virtually until health and safety concerns can be significantly lowered and or eliminated, right, as appropriate on this particular campus. So to be clear, our campus remains open as a university. Our university is still very operational through remote capabilities, and we are accessible to members of the campus and greater community, right, for its day-to-day -day operations, in large part because of our stellar IT uh, department headed by Vice President Manriquez, who you had a chance to meet before. So most physical spaces on campus have been and will continue to remain, right, locked until such time as it's safe to repopulate them, even though we have activity going on in remote locations that try to duplicate what it is we would do in a more face-to-face -face environment. Now, recent town halls and online new student orientations that have been held on the campus have demonstrated that while the COVID-19 pandemic may have disrupted our operations, the Toro community is strong and united as ever and striving to create the best possible outcomes right, in an unfortunate situation we find our students in. So what does that mean in common sense language? We have new student orientations for new freshmen and transfer students who have been admitted to the campus and accepted our invitation to come and study here in the Toro Nation. So under the guidance of Dr. William Franklin, his team are putting together new student orientation programs for the summer, supported by staff and faculty, who then work with them to give them a proper orientation of folk. All that is going on for both new students, our freshmen, I think, will begin to happen as well. So we are continuing to do all those things in support of our students because we want them to have a first-in-class experience, even as we adjust to this COVID-19 uh, space that we're in. Now, let me see if we can't move in to give you an update on how the campus continues to grow. So, Gamer, if you would share with our community uh, the following slides. So, what do you see? As for our future at Dominguez Hills, we continue to grow and expand year by year, trying to rapidly position ourselves as one of America's leading urban universities. In fact, if I have my way, we are going to be the model urban metropolitan university in the country. So as you'll see on the above slide, we have just been two years ago accredited, which reaffirmed, right, our gold standard for meeting the quality standards of accreditation for universities, I think, in the country. That is a 10-year mark, right? That is very, very important to us, to have a 10-year accreditation. We currently have 67 total degree programs, 45 undergraduate, 22 graduate degrees. And also we are introducing this fall majors in Asian Pacific Studies and Women's Studies as part of our intellectual lineup. We have new master's programs coming online in systems engineering and cybersecurity, respectively. And also many of you may have heard that we got our first doctoral program. Our first doctoral degree in occupational therapy. We'll be offering that starting in the fall of 2023. We are the only public university in Southern California to offer it. The other one will be in Northern California. Also, I'm proud to uh, uh, showcase that we have a new co-curricular esports program uh, under the guidance of Ruben Caputo, so I want to give him a shout out this evening. Now, some of you say, but why electronic sports? Why are we doing that? Because esports, ladies and gentlemen, is not an outcome. It is a strategy. And if you think about the electronic gaming with the coding you learn, with the writing you have to do when you think about avatars and players, with the geometry, the quantitative reasoning you have to engage in, with the positioning of your characters, with the critical thinking you have to engage in, there are hard and soft skills that those students learn, and those adults really, who engage in electronic gaming. And we think those skills have a functional utility to help students manage as a transferable asset the rigors of a university curriculum in other subjects. So we are looking to uh, open our first esports arena that will in fact have an opportunity to both do competition, yes, but we'll have an academic and research component, we'll have an entertainment component, as well as a community component as a way to engage the broader and surrounding community as well. And also in terms of our uh, academic depth, we are proud to announce 
that our College of Business Administration and Public Policy has just earned the AACSB accreditation. So that sounds like an applause line, right? For all of us there, that is a big deal for us and for your university. So we also want you to know that as we grow, we continue to get thousands, 38,000 plus applications from students. We have a population, as I said earlier, of 17,027 students, right? And that population is looking to continue to grow in those important areas. So we are just excited about where we were. So we're very excited about what's going on with that. Thank you for sharing that slide with our folks. Now, as we think about just about a month ago when our College of Business Administration and Public Policy received that accreditation news, we were so excited because what it does is it helps to speak to not only the value of the degree and the trajectory that it's gonna raise for our students who are graduating and those who will attend, but it really signals another measure of excellence. It talks about a, 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 an institutional anchor that says that we are committed to upholding the most rigorous standards of education for our students here. And having that College of Business and Public Policy accredited to us is a big deal, so we really appreciate that. Now, let me talk about some of the infrastructure growth that you'll see in the community. So if you haven't driven by the campus of late and you wanna know why we're all smiling and our new VP, Vice President Wallace is smiling a lot, it is because we have three new buildings. So with our enrollment and curriculum expanding, the physical campus at the university continues to grow as well. So I wanna direct your attention to these particular slides. On the right side of the slide, you'll see our brand new science and innovation building. This is a brand new building we've just finished in December and January. And we are now outfitting that building, setting up labs, setting up faculty offices as they move in, even in the midst of a COVID environment. But this will be the new model of what STEM education looks like at California State University, Dominguez Hills, right? We are very, very proud of it. That flanks the south side of the campus. On the north side along Victoria, you may notice some construction. Well, the artist rendering you see in your top left of the screen is our innovation and instruction building that will house, in fact, among other things, our uh, College of Business Administration and Public Policy there. We also want you to know that I have said since I've been here that I think our housing footprint is too small, that we need to grow it to become less of a commuter campus and more of a residential one. And the first down payment on that is now about to take place, where what you see in the bottom left of your screen is our student housing complex, which is not just a dormitory or residence hall. It is a living learning community. And then in this living learning community, this will add another 506 bed spaces for our students once it is fully occupied. And we are excited about that. Again, that is our first down payment on trying to improve the infrastructure. So what does that mean, hashtag? Your California State University, Dominguez Hills, is growing, but we are also trying to right, increase the infrastructure to be able to support our students. Now, lastly on this I'll say, there's an old piece of African wisdom that says, it is the outer garment that best adorns the inner beauty of the person. So when we wanna highlight the magnificent and, and, and supportive uh, intellectual rigor and excellence that exists among our faculty, it is now these buildings that will help frame it. These are the outer garments that will best adorn the academic excellence that exists within our campus. And we want you as a community to take as much pride in these new buildings as we do on this campus. So please be excited about those. So together with these new buildings, it'll improve both our instructional and research capacity, and it'll transform the aesthetic ambiance of the Domingo Hills campus and this community for sure. So thank you for sharing that with our community residents. Now, my mantra throughout this crisis has been very simple. Crisis reveals character. Crisis also exposes weakness in an organization or entity. But crisis also provides opportunity. So the Toro Nation has indeed shown 
what it is truly made of during this pandemic, revealing its togetherness and absolute commitment to serving the community. So let me show you how Toros have been making a difference. So if you want to know what we have been up to, why does what we do on this campus matter in your life? Well, for example, as I touched on before, our Center for Innovation in STEM Education and our occupational therapy program have been making face shields using our fabrication laboratory technology. As a joint press conference with Senator Steve Bradford that you see pictured in the bottom middle of your screen, we recently announced a donation of face shields to frontline medical personnel at UCLA, uh, Harbor UCLA Medical Center, right, to highlight this effort. Meanwhile, staff at our Center for Service Learning, Internships and Civic Engagement have been busy making cloth masks for the community at large as well. Also, through our CSUDH Basic Needs Initiative, bi-weekly on-campus food distributions have been coordinated to help our most vulnerable students during these trying times. So taking care of our campus community is always at the forefront of what we do. And I'm also participating in a number of virtual community forums on topics that our society is facing. So as this region and university, our ability to stay connected and remain connected to you all is very important to us. So we're glad we're able to do that. Now, our university is here to serve the community, as I've said before, and especially as we move toward the phase of relief effort. So when we think about our College of Extended and International Education, one of our six colleges, courses and seminars have been developed on assisting with resources for small businesses, right? as members of our community. So let's see if we can't show the next slide. Where are we making an impact here? So from seminars to how to manage remote employees to small business emergency planning, these faculty-led courses are open to all members and small business community and can help make a difference as the economy begins to reopen. The College of Extended Education and International Education is offered also preparing a proposed $2 million economic development grant to help local small business in our communities survive the pandemic and become even more resilient and resourceful in the process. For our lifelong learners, our Ali Institute is a program designed especially for our community members over the age of 50. So this is a great way to enhance and enrich your continued learning through non-credit courses taught by our faculty and experts on a wide range of topics. And as we adjusted to the current new realities, our Ali members are being shown how to use webinar technology for their classes in everything from arts and literature to health and well-being. How supportive are we trying to be of this population? Now, as we near the end of my remarks, and we get ready to take your questions. I'd like to point out that this past spring semester has not been what we envisioned for our students and especially for our graduating seniors. Like most, if not all, students in this nation, both in colleges and high schools, their academic and personal worlds have been literally disrupted by the current health crisis. But throughout these past months, our university has remained mission focused even as we have had to rapidly transition our entire campus to a remote environment. But our faculty worked tirelessly to ensure that alternate forms of instruction were developed and were based on sound pedagogy and evidence-based practices. And I wanna applaud them for their commitment and dedication to our students. Beyond maintaining campus services, our Dominguez Hill staff and faculty with the assistance of students are also using the knowledge and skills to create resources that healthcare agencies and municipalities desperately need to fight the global pandemic. So as the world continues to come to terms with COVID pandemic, public institutions like your Dominguez Hills campus are doing everything possible to ensure the health and safety of our students, faculty, and staff. And so the university has set up a student emergency grant fund and it's available through our website to be able to help those students most in need. And so that grant fund is available. And the impact of this pandemic, ladies and gentlemen, has caused so much distress. And our pursuit of knowledge shouldn't be 
right, a barrier, but can be, right, facilitated when there is financial support to dissipate and mitigate against the financial constraints, right, that people are hampered with. So for ways to help support, please go to www.csudh.edu slash online giving. Let me say that again, www.csudh.edu slash online giving, one word. Or you can call the Office of Development at area code 310-243-2182 if you have interest in wanting to support any of our students or those struggling through the pandemic. Now I know that by working together, even when doing so remotely, we can and will emerge from this crisis with a renewed spirit and fresh passion for what we do. They say that absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I can truthfully say that I cannot wait until I can once again walk the corridors and traverse the open spaces of our gorgeous campus. I miss it. And running in university from my office on lockdown, right, is a hard thing to do. But I'm passionate about the work. And I want you to be passionate about what this university has been doing on all of our behalves. So this year, I should close by reminding us again, marks our 60th anniversary. And it's a remarkable journey that we have been on and it will be on for the next two or three years that we celebrate the 60th anniversary about the campus's founding, our opening, our relocation, the admission of the first students, and the first graduation that we held way back in the day. And so we want folks to certainly pay attention to that because that'll be important. With over 100,000 proud Toro alumni throughout the state and the world, right? In fact, 65% of those graduates live within the 30 mile radius of the campus. The vast majority living in the communities, right? Your offices represent bringing their passion and expertise to industries throughout the region. Indeed, these turtles are making a difference. So with the continued support of the community, our California State University, Dominguez Hills will continue to grow and thrive. And that I think is important. Now, before I open it up for questions and answers, my team and I decided how can we get them excited not just about listening to a president talk about how proud we are and how much we've adapted. So we thought, hmm, I know. Let's show them a little bit about what everybody else at Dominguez Hills is saying. So I've got a quick video for you. I'd like you to pay attention to. It's a little over a minute and a half long, but it'll show you and capture the spirit of what we're doing on campus. So let's see if we can't roll the video. Here at California State University Dominguez Hills, we have something to celebrate every day of the year. We celebrate community. CSUDH is proud to be a part of California's South Bay. And we strive to form lasting partnerships with the people and industries around us. We celebrate diversity. Every person is unique. And it takes all kinds to create a vibrant, exciting community of learners and scholars. We celebrate the opportunity to dream. We help students bring their dreams to life. Transforming themselves and the communities that they call home. We celebrate achievement. Our graduates have gone on to become state and national office holders and leaders in science, industry, and the arts. We celebrate sustainability. We work to make sustainable, environmental, social, and economic practices a way of life. We celebrate innovation. Our new state-of-the-art science innovation building will keep CSUDH at the forefront of STEM education. We celebrate creativity. We foster imagination and inspire students to follow their own individual paths. We celebrate our past and the legacy we have inherited. CSUDH has been proudly educating and uplifting students for over 50 years and doing so with a mind on social justice. We celebrate the future. With three new building projects rising on campus, our future looks brighter than ever. Join us in celebrating all that we've accomplished and all that we have planned in the new year. Welcome to the greatest semester yet at California State University, Dominguez Hills. So with that, we'll say thank you for allowing us to provide you with this summary. Now we'd like to open it up and receive whatever questions or comments that you may have. So, Carl, let me turn it back over to you and help guide us in this next phase of the, uh, 
uh, of this endeavor. So. Thank you for that. We had some hands up and then they disappeared. We also had some questions that have already been answered, but um, I'm going to go ahead and give opportunities for people to raise their hand. And I will uh, apologize in advance if I do not pronounce your names correctly. Um, I will do my very best to do that. Um, Myron Shu, we've got your hand up. Would you like to have the mic, please? Go ahead. Unmute yourself. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Welcome. My name is Myron Shu. You know, um, I'm also excited about you know. Uh, finally, we uh, got the ASSB accreditation achieved. Okay, this effort, you know, is an endeavor for decades. So finally, under President Pahan leadership, we got this implemented. Okay. Um, during this um, Black Lives Matter movement, I've been thinking hard, okay? I think uh, in our five learning goals at the program level, we missed one. We emphasized, we dropped, which is diversity and social responsibility. Hmm. I was strongly, you know, support to add this back to our learning goal. I'm going to implement it. I'm going to embed into our courses to have a logical, um, calm debate, interactive discussion to bring to a high level understanding of this important topic. So getting ASSB is just the beginning of another Better for high achievement. So we're not going to, we are not only going to keep it, we will be the top one among this elite group. Okay. So thank you for your support. Okay. That's just my thought. Yeah. Thank you, Myron. I want to also say that, um, and I want to turn the mic over to the provost who wants to speak on this, I'm sure, but um, this accreditation is not simply achieved under this president as I mentioned earlier, that a president is really only as good as the work produced by the people who work with and for them. And so this provost and I challenged a, a, a dean and an entire faculty uh, to be able to come to terms with what they needed to do. And I really want to give credit to that entire faculty who really stepped up and really just did a heavy lift. Um, and the alternative was not pretty. It was either let's lift it or go on home. And they decided to lift it and that's how much pride they have in wanting to produce excellence on behalf of our students. And you're right, Myron, that we're able to do something that we were not able to do as a campus in over 27 years, I think. So that's important. But it was an entire team of people who did this. And I really need to give credit to both Dean Joseph Wynn, who led that effort uh, in support of the faculty, as well as this provost here, who is just a, a stellar individual that's part of this team, who's our chief academic officer, who really did a lot of the the work as well. Mike Spagna, you want to jump in here? Yeah, just to reinforce what the president shared, and Dr. Shu was one of the key leaders in this. And as the president said, the faculty really stepped up. Our accrediting visitors came to our campus, and they actually, when they gave us the good news, they said that Dominguez Hills is a model for a campus that aspires to large goals and then meets them. So they, they were nothing but complimentary. And remember, again, that by getting this accreditation, we now qualify as the top 5% of business schools in the nation and internationally. And the most important thing for us is now having this accreditation, students have uh, gateways open to them to uh, go ahead and get connected with honor societies related to business, accounting and so forth. This will appear on their transcripts. So when they go looking for jobs in their career adventures, they're gonna have this extra stamp of approval that's gonna give them that extra oomph to get that job and be successful. And especially on the other side of this pandemic, there's nothing that could be more special in terms of supporting our students that thrive after they get their degrees here. There have been a couple questions online about our master's programs, and we currently are in the place of designing three new master's programs in business uh, to be able to kind of reach market demands out there. So nothing but positive news on that front. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Provo. Uh, Carol, let's go to our next question. Okay, Kevin W., I see that you have your hand up, but you also had a question uh, that I believe got answered, but we're going to go ahead and let's release the mic. And if you have another question, go right ahead. 
Uh, I didn't know that you answered that question. It was about Cam, so I could check it out in the response. Okay, it's it's there. But just to to go back to that, the question was: Is Cam's going to be open? Um, I believe in this fall. And the response to that was yes, with some limitations. We are currently in conversations with them. So, thank you, Kevin. Absolutely right. Uh, Jim Deere, you are next. Go ahead. You should be able to. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Hello. Oh, Hi, Jim. How are you? Good, good. Uh, President Farnham. Um, I'm the mayor pro tem of the city of Carson, and it's not so much a question. I just want to compliment you on a, and your staff on an excellent presentation to the community and to assure all the current students at Cal State University, uh, Dominguez Sales, and future students that uh, the community, the city government, uh, and myself uh, will be there uh, supportive of the campus on all levels, and we really look uh, forward to a great future at Cal State Dominguez for everyone included. So that's my only comment. And uh, again, thank you for this opportunity. We appreciate that, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, and, and want to thank you for your support and leadership as well. Uh, I promised when I came here to be a transparent leader, but also to go and not simply meet with community, but also to meet with city government. And they have been very uh, responsive to my request to meet with them. They've been engaging in their request to come meet with me when we needed to do that. And that's why I'm really so grateful for the uh, David Gambos of the world, the Kalia Bradshaws of the world, who really connect me and this campus to the community at large and support of what it is that we want to do. So we look forward to the strategic partnership that we enjoy and putting together some synergy so that one and one equals three and we move on in the future to be able to do some fabulous things together. Great. Danny Bakewell Jr., you are next. Please go ahead. Oh, my. How are you? I think you can unmute yourself. One more try. Not working? Then maybe. Oh, there, there you go. go. There we go. So, hello, President Parham. First off, uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you for all that you have done and do in this community. Um, Obviously a fantastic job. I just had one quick, simple question. With the uh, transformation to an on, all online or majority online curriculum for the summer and this semester, have you been able to enlarge your enrollment or is it still pretty much uh, the same enrollment as it would be in the event that uh, campus was open and students would be walking around? So right now it's about the same, but rather than hear from me. First of all, I want to I wanna thank you for being with us. Uh, what you and your family have done for years has been important. And if there was ever a key strategic stakeholder that this university was tied to, it certainly is not only the Brotherhood Crusade, but the LA Sentinel and the work that you've done. You folk are just warriors in the community and we appreciate really the connectedness that we have to you and the support that you provide in a whole host of ways. Uh, but Dr. Franklin, let me give you the mic and invite you to really talk to folk about our admissions numbers and what we anticipate for the fall, because this is our enrollment guru. And if you want to know why we do all the wonderful things we do, it's not because of this president, it's because of this team right here. And Dr. Franklin leads that effort. Dr. Franklin, go ahead and wax away in a little bit. Yeah, this is really good because I am a huge fan of the Bakewells and everything you've done for this community. And, and my mom was truly a champion of the Sentinel. You better not throw her Sentinel away or you would be in a whole lot of trouble. So, so it gives me honor to answer this question on, on behalf of just knowing that, but our enrollment is looking extremely healthy. One of the things that we can't quite put our finger on because we've never had a national pandemic of this proportion is why our continuing students are, are coming back in larger numbers than they were pre-pandemic. It's a phenomenal question we're gonna get into and analyze along with the provost and Chris Manriquez and, and Deb from the finance side, um, but we're looking good in terms of our continuing student enrollment. And our new student enrollment has not dipped um, in the way that we thought it was. We put a lot of uh, what I would call guardrails up to ensure that we didn't decrease in enrollment. 
And what we found is that those guardrails weren't needed as much because our first time full time freshmen, as well as our transfers from our partner community colleges, they are enrolling in very healthy ways. And what we're trying to do is to get out of their way to ensure that we release any kind of financial holds and work with them in the midst of this pandemic to ensure that if they can't pay new student orientation fees, that those fees are covered. So we're really trying to make sure they have all the technology they need. But right now, enrollment is looking very healthy. And we we have not, as most of you around the, the, um, this place know, that we have not been open in the spring for years, now almost a decade. So we always have spring to rely on if our enrollment should dip a little. But right now, things are looking very healthy. And that's why the provost has that really big smile on his face, because academically, we're pretty strong in terms of our returning students and our new students who are going to be totals for life. So thanks for that question. I would also uh, add to that, uh, Brother Makewell, that um, what Dr. Franklin didn't mention, I think, were some decisions I think that uh, he made uh, in conjunction with this uh, executive management team about support we wanted to provide to families. There were some universities when we normally have a May 1st uh, intent to enroll deadline, and we decided to move that to June 1st to give them an extra month to make that decision, just in support of them. Now, there are a number of universities who rush to say, uh, let me try to get those enrollment numbers real quick and try to solidify. But that's thinking really what's in the best interest of the university and not necessarily what's in the best interest of the community. And so we were able to do that and give them a little bit of time. So as a consequence, we're a little delayed in trying to figure out exactly how those numbers are gonna crystallize. Uh, what Dr. Franklin also didn't talk about is the fact that once you have an intent to enroll new students, either freshmen or transfers, there sometimes is a drop off between those who say they're coming and those who actually enroll come fall census. So what we're hoping is that the numbers who are uh, intending to enroll actually do enroll. And so if that number stays high and the continuing students continues to elevate the way it has to really almost unprecedented numbers, then I think our enrollment looks relatively robust, I think, for the fall. Uh, are we still looking to grow? Yes, I would love it in my lifetime if we could grow this campus, not only to about 20, but way beyond that. I think we have a landmass that'll help us grow to maybe 25, uh, but it takes a significant amount of investment for us to be able to do that and community engagement, which is why we're so uh, blessed to have partners like you who know and realize the importance of that. Mr. Provost, come and weigh in for us. Yeah, and I would add to that really this, this word we've been using a lot on campus, which, which is interdependence with the community. We're going to do our best and get students through and make sure they're successful and get wonderful academic degrees. We're going to need your help to get them jobs. In order on the other side of this pandemic for our whole region to recover, we're going to need to all work together to get our, our students out into jobs and reproducing a, a, a wonderful economy, economy here in Southern California. So we're going to need your help, interdependence. Yeah, thank you for that. Carl, we got another question. We do. Uh, Shirley Tolentino, you are up. Your hand's up. Hi, Shirley. Go right ahead. Let's try that one more time. If you unmute yourself, you'll be able to. There you go. Oh, hi. How are you today? We're doing great. Welcome. Hi. I just want to know if that... Um, when, uh, for example, for in the future, when it, um, during the time of COVID-19, when people can, uh, for example, people can work as essential workers, do, they think, do you think they can do screening too, included? Okay, if you're asking, I think what you're asking is, in the future when we get back to work, can we as a campus do screening? Uh, for example, when you take like a screening, if it's a normal or like having a, for example, yeah, just like uh, most students when they come back to uh, campus, so each uh, staff can do screening, each student. Ah, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Yes. So um, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Vice President Wallace because I want her to uh, meet the community and for you as a community to meet her and know why we are blessed to have her as well. But um, what she'll help to, to help understand is that the available of mass testing in the country right now does not exist. And so if we could mass test everybody tomorrow, we could open up the country the next day, almost. 
because we could, we'd, we'd have a little bit more assurance. We'd know who was impacted. We'd know how to isolate them. We know how to trace, you know, where they are. We could do those things. But because of that, it's a little bit unclear. And the incidence and prevalence data, both new cases and total number of cases, as well as the mortality rates are still going up, particularly where we are in LA County. So for the foreseeable future, we will be in that space of having to um, uh, go mostly virtual until we start to see those numbers decline and that trend line start to go down instead of going up where it's still going. Uh, they're also predicting, I think, a second wave and a spike uh, and that's coming in the fall. And so we are being prepared for that. But uh, Vice President Wallace, I think, can talk us through the provisions that she and her team uh, have been doing. And they've been doing just magnificent work uh, to be able to help us out do that. So Vice President Wallace, take the floor if you would. So Shirley, thank you for your question. And, and it's, a, it's a valid one, um, considering if we just, you know, as we move into this reopen space. Um, just to let you know kind of what we've been doing, um, I am helping to direct, there is a, as a team that has been working on, during this crisis, um, basically every day. We meet every day at 9 a.m. talking through some of the equipment and some of the um, protocol that's going to be needed as we begin to do some of this soft reopen and things like that. So we have been discussing your question and talking about how we would do that from an access standpoint, as you know, and I think Dr. Um, Parham mentioned, we, we have a very large campus as far as landmass is concerned with um, varying access points to um, the buildings and on the campus. So we've been talking about how do we do that if we decide to do some of that screening and testing and we're continuing to have some of that dialogue. Um, I know we've been also working with the Chancellor's Office who is also providing us some of that guidance as we begin to um, talk about how we can um, keep folks safe as they, you know, um, come on the campus. So we're we're still looking at some of those protocols. We've been doing a lot of planning. We put several um, planning documents in place that are going to provide that additional support because our number one priority is making sure that the health and safety and, and welfare of those that are coming back on the campus is met. So um, we're continuing in that effort and um, just, just keep us in your thoughts as we, as we make these plans. I should also say, um, finally, Shirley, that um, you asked the question about are we going to be doing the testing? And the answer to that is no. In a limited amount, we may have our, our physicians and other folk who do that, but everything we do and every decision we make around the health and safety of this campus is made in conjunction with our partners in the public health department. And so to as much as possible, we want folk to be able to stay in their lanes. And so it is public health people and medical professionals who need to be doing the, 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 the testing for us even as we partner with them to figure out what we can do in terms of providing other provisions for either tracing or PPE equipment and other things that we can make available for students. But again, we won't open up anything until we think it's safe and that'll be our first priority there. Thank you for your question and thank you for being with us. Excellent, thank you for your patience. Gilbert Smith, you are next. Gil Smith. I think you can unmute yourself right now. As you know, I've been under the, the weather here for the last couple of months, um, having had a little bit of surgery, but I, I'm back and I'm looking forward to a very exciting period of growth and, uh, and listening to the presentations today by our president, Dr. Parham, uh, and, and the faculty and the excitement tied to new buildings and new opportunity. Uh, it spurs what has been a challenge for Cal State Dominguez Hills from day one, and that is our outreach to the broader community, recognizing that uh, the diversity presents all kinds of challenges and, and opportunities, but at the same time, it provides uh, uh, the, the kind of uh, stimulus that should, in fact, uh, be more attractive uh, to others. And as we look around our community, the development of partnerships 
with other uh, institutions such as uh, Kaiser, such as uh, City of Hope, such as uh, LA Biomed, and such as a variety of other medical institutions uh, where we could develop a, a significant partnership uh, for the expansion and uh, uh, challenging academic opportunity. Um, uh, before I sit down here, because my wife is sitting next to me and, uh, and she wants a moment to say a, a word or two, although she's shaking her head at the moment. Uh, what I want to say is congratulations, uh, Dr. Parham, and to Cal State Dominguez Hills. We're looking forward to an exciting next 10 years. Uh, when you mentioned 2020, we've received, uh, of course, a, a mailing here recently that is 6060, uh, and that will pre pre provide a um, uh, a stimulus for our university. Uh, thank you. It's exciting to be back and uh, standing up rather than laying down. Uh, right. And I'm looking forward to working with with all of you. Before before I go, that this partnership is within the institution itself, not just Cal State Dominguez Hills, but the the 23 campuses that make up the system. And we, we uh, need to expand uh, our uh, relationships with other institutions so that we recognize that we're a team and we're not competing with one another. Uh, but we can talk about that uh, in the, the months to come. But, Thank you very much and congratulations, Dr. Parham, and to the university, and God bless you all. Thank you, Gail. And uh, I should also say, um, while uh, uh, we still have Gail's attention, even as we've muted the mic, that first of all, I want to say greetings to he and Shirley. Um, Gail, for those of you who don't know, was very connected to uh, the city of Carson way back in the day and in part is one of those key stakeholders responsible for the university being in the position that it's in. And so I want to give kudos to that and, and say thank you and Shirley for your tremendous support uh, in those ways. Um, I think you also mentioned that Cal State Dominguez Hills is one of the, the uh, campuses in the CSU system. There are 23 of us. So there are 22 others beside Dominguez Hills. Collectively, we are the biggest system of public higher education in all of America. We educate some 490,000 students every year. And so we take that as a badge of honor. And unlike some of our other counterparts who spend their days touting how wonderful they are because they have been able to have selectivity ratios where they only select a very few students and educate folk at the top 1%, we are proud of being able to educate a much broader swatch of the normal curve. And so we have students who are straight 4 old students and students who are 2.3s trying to be 2.5s and 2.5s trying to be 3.0s and 3.0s trying to be 3.5. And so we take that as a badge of honor. Uh, we very much care about that. And that is our community that we are trying to really support. And so those strategic partnerships that you talked about, Gil, are gonna be very, very important for that. And I simply wanna thank you and surely for your tireless work and advocacy and support on behalf of the campus and this entire community. So God bless you, brother. I'm glad you're feeling better. Other folks, Kara? Uh, we do have one person left, but before we go there, I just wanted to um, invite the attendees to review the question and answer panel and to consider sharing your thoughts and your questions. We have a, a dedicated group of panelists who have been superbly answering all of the questions that are there. Um, and so you might find something that, of interest in one of those sections. Our last person, at this time at 6.34, is Pramod Nath. You have the microphone, go ahead. Pramod, welcome. Uh, hello, Dr. Pramod? Yes, hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great. 
So for the internships, for, for example, the JS internships, how are they going to be held this fall? Okay, say that one more time. Yeah. You're asking about the internships and how will they be held this fall? Yeah, how will they be held? Okay, let me uh, invite our provost, in fact, to weigh in on that because we've... Yeah, I, I, ans I answered this online also, but it's good for everybody that uh, internships are not going to come to a halt. Uh, that's part of our larger planning document, and the majority, vast majority of the work we'll be doing face-to-face -face will be out in the community. So internships will certainly be part of it. Uh, for specifics related to your program specifically and the, the specific internship, we would direct you to your chair and to the dean of that respective college. So uh, if you identify that for me in the chat, I'd be happy to connect you with that respective dean and chair. Perfect. Also, uh, just real quickly there, uh, just to remind the attendees that the recording of this event will be made available. Uh, it will be on YouTube, uh, but it will not be for probably another 24 to 48 hours. Yeah, good. And Kara, while we have a, a minute, while we're waiting on a couple of other questions, I want to see if we can't highlight a couple elements of the university to let them know what we're doing. So I want to call on uh, Vice President Chris Manriquez, who many of you have not met. I want you to have a chance to meet him. He is what we affectionately call our technology guru, um, but he is doing just your person's work to try to not only help us really move through uh, the spring, but also prepare for the summer and position us, I think, for next year and moving into this virtual reality. So. Vice President Marriquez, talk to the people about what you've been doing and what's on your priority list. Certainly. Uh, first to the, the uh, city of Carson, uh, welcome. I've been one of your commissioners on the uh, Innovation and Technology Commission, serving for your city for a number of years, and it's been uh, great work there. And also wanted to communicate that what we're doing on the campus, that we're also bridging with the community. Many of the things we're doing uplifting on the campus are around our academic mission in particular, uplifting, as you've heard before, moving into the virtual space. We also have a series of engagements you've heard the president talk about around esports initiatives with students that would be engaging both inner, um, both across collegiate competition as well as potentially coming up over a period of time, other engagements that engage with the community once COVID starts uh, lessening itself over a period of time. Additionally, we have an incubator, innovation incubator on campus that engage, has engaged at large with the community, both in small, biz, small business and medium business areas. And then in, in technology infrastructure on the campus as well, we've engaged really in large part in uplifting the entire campus infrastructure, looking into build outs for Wi-Fi and engaging with the community in that build out, as well as with the infrastructure on the campus for additional hardware components and software, such that we're able to bridge some of these partnership relations to expand Wi-Fi into the community. So thank you for the moments of time, uh, President Barham. And thank you. And, um... It's important, I think, that, that people know. Talk to them, Chris, if, if you will, for just another minute about, um, I talked about crisis exposes weakness and it's allowed us to do some things. Talk to them about our loan program and other things that they may not be aware of, right, that are important aspects of what we're preparing to do for the fall as well. So some of the things we've done through COVID, if we use the, the previous six and a half weeks as uh, responding to more urgencies that we've had on campus. We've moved from a system where we had a checkout program that's always been available for first time freshmen who come in desiring or requiring technology in order to address the academic needs. We've expanded that program more broadly across the internal campus community to also provide support for faculty, staff, and management to provide those devices, both hardware and software, for people to be able to have accessibility at home to technology. Now, we did that in two ways. One is in the short period of time, we were able to get people to have devices check out before the campus was where the physical location was uh, closed down or a little more tightly restricted. What we've done in the, in the intermediate period is we've actually had drive up facilities very similar to the way we've made food available to people through our sustainability builds, where people drive up and pick up their laptop devices as, other, as well as other MiFi devices as well. We're looking to use that addition, that service component that we've got built out also over the coming semester to be able to provision out uh, large scale uh, print requests, as well as a whole series of other requests that our faculty, staff and management might actually have available as well. So Good, yeah, thank you for that. 
And I want folks to know while we, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to this other question in a second, but when we talk about the, the academic and the co-curricular, there are a fair amount of our student services that are available. And, and I wrote a letter uh, some time ago, weeks ago actually, about why students should not really take a gap year. And partly what I assured them is that we would be providing a robust set of support services for our students to help them better manage the rigors of a university curriculum. A lot of that reports to uh, Dr. William Franklin, who you met. Dr. Franklin, if you would, talk to the people about uh, the services that are available and what some of our student peers, in fact, have been doing even to support their other students. Yeah, prior to um, this health crisis, um, Dominguez Hills was affectionately known as both a high-touch campus and thanks to Chris, we're also high-tech. And that blend is important. Most of our students are first gen. Most of our students come from underrepresented communities, um, at least in higher ed, um, in terms of underrepresented um, populations. And most of our students come in needing some form of development in either math or English. So we are by design a high touch campus, but it's not just about the academics. We also have a strong co-curricular um, a connection to our students through our affinity centers, our male success alliance program, through all of our, our supplemental instruction programs and our tutoring programs, as well as our clubs and organizations. We know very early on that involvement, involvement, involvement can allow students to really make and, and plant their flag around student success. And so we have a lot of programs where we try to get students involved in clubs and organizations, not just in the colleges, but also in some extracurricular activities, which are really important. And lastly, I'll end with one of the things that we know for certain is that if students can get involved in terms of working with faculty on graduate internships and graduate programs and, and new student um, pieces as well as student research, we know that they could, they're not only retained, they thrive. And so we take great pride in making sure that our co-curricular programs match the stellar academic and curricular programs that we have so that our students can thrive. And, and it has certainly, I, I, I applaud the faculty for making the transition to this um, virtual world, but I, I always applaud our staff for doing similarly. They found ways to connect and, and our students are, are, they, they are, they are tech natives. And so they made the transition smoothly once their, their technology caught up with them and our, fa our, our staff are right alongside them trying to make sure that we try to find ways to connect them even though we're social distancing. And that will be the challenge moving forward. How do we do a better job of that until on the spring we're back doing one big old giant hug on our new quad. Um, but until then, we got to find a way to connect our students and make sure that they have the technology they need in order to thrive. Perfect. And um, I see we have some questions in the Q&A room, but before I get to those, there one is about the OLLI program. Someone asked the provost to weigh in on that. And one is about the, the technology loaner program. I want to uh, ask Chris to weigh in on that. But I want to spend a minute. We got about 20 minutes left in our town hall to Cara to uh, uh, really put out the recognition that several folk are joining us by phone and not by uh, Zoom. So there's no way for them to really raise their hand to let us know that they're in the queue. So I wonder if we can find a way in an orderly fashion to invite anybody who's on the phone who hasn't had a chance to really raise their hand to just kind of politely jump in and see if you have a question for us as well. Let me pause about four or five seconds and see if there's somebody on the phone who has a question. Indeed, um, Dr. Parham, under reactions, there should be um, a little interface that allows them to raise their hand. If not, um, we can go in and release the mic and uh, go by last four digits of the phone number and see if they would like to speak or not. Um, so if you can take a moment to see if you can find that button. Um, and if not, I'm gonna go ahead and start with um, 0244. If you would like to have the opportunity to speak, I'm going to go ahead and release the microphone to you. You are yes. There you go. Can you Introduce let us yourself. Know? Yes, I, I am Mayor Pro Temp Emma Sharif from the city of Compton, and I really want to just say I'm listening to everything. I didn't get a chance to see the presentation, but I'm listening to everything that's being said, and I'm very excited about what's happening here at Cal State University Mingus Hills. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Parham and his staff for doing an amazing job as I drive by this campus and I'm constantly driving by to see all the new buildings and everything that's coming here is just truly amazing for this community and for this, uh, for the, uh, uh, this college as well. So I just want to just say thanks to all of you for all the work that you do. 
we appreciate that and we want to thank and celebrate you for all the work you do. Uh, and um, Councilwoman Sharif also being a, a, a Toro, uh, really appreciate that as well. So uh, we are grateful for you. Thank you for being on the phone call today. Car, we have another phone call? We do, the last four digits are 3080. You have the microphone if you would like to share, if not. Hi, this is Erica Tinsley. Um, I've been listening. I had to call in because I'm traveling right now, so I'm on the go. But um, I don't have any questions, but I have been listening, and I'm very proud to be an alumni and with all the things that are going on on campus and with the university. So thank you all um, for this awesome town hall, and I'm still here listening until it's over. And Erica, where are you now traveling? I'm um, in route to Dallas, so I'm going there for my employer. We have an office there in McKinney, so. Okay, and Erica, you, uh, people won't know this because I need to tell a story about Erica, but um, uh, can you share with folk who you work for? Is that, is that public knowledge? Oh, yeah, I work, at, I work in the defense industry at um, Raytheon Space and Airborne in El Segundo, so I've been there for about three years. So Erica is, is an individual that I met my first year here, ladies and gentlemen. And her, her being here tonight is just is, is so important, I think, for us. And we're delighted alums. But Erica is an example of an individual who coming through uh, and finishing high school uh, had no uh, really crystallized plans about attending college, worked for years got connected to, right, staff and faculty at Dominguez Hills, advised her about what she needed to do to be admitted, uh, went on to community college to finish, finished later here and came and transferred to Dominguez Hills, finished up, did exceptionally well, not just finished up, and is now out working, right, in the uh, defense industry doing that work. And so she is the best example of the phrase that I coined, and I have a shirt actually made up that is called Dominguez Hills Transforms Lives That Transform America. So the campus, I think, helped to transform her life. She is now transforming America in the defense industry. And Erica, I want you to know how proud of you we are, not just because you are a Toro alum, but because of just the grit, the perseverance, the determination that you illustrated in just your own personal journey. And what you did is a tribute really to your family, to your own uh, self, and just know that we are so proud of you, but you are really the anchor behind the slogan, we transform lives and transform America. So know we love you and we appreciate you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Parham. And I'm also, I'm excited about the new systems engineering um, masters you guys have. I actually um, spoke or had a lot um, work with some people when they were developing that program at Dominguez. So I'm an engineer at Raytheon now. I started off in cyber, but now I'm doing systems engineering um, at Raytheon. So hopefully um, I'll be able to bring some of the students at Cal State Dominguez over as interns or you know, even when they finish the program, just to let them know that we have a lot of talent coming from Cal State Dominguez too, and the recruiters can come look now locally since we do have that program on campus. Yeah, very much so. So appreciate that very much. Uh, I know we've got a couple questions, so I want to try to go really quick because point value is a double. We've got about 12 minutes left, maybe a couple minutes more. Let me start with Ali. Let me go to the loaner program, and then I got to hit on the 60 for 60, somebody asked a question about. Mr. Provost, if you would. Yeah, so I really appreciate it. Nicole had this uh, in the Q&A about Ali, and uh, we're really dedicated to lifelong learning. Uh, and, it's, and we've actually received several questions tonight uh, in the chat room about, uh, do we support working adults? Uh, so the short answer is, heck yeah. Uh, not only do we support them, but we pride ourselves on that ability with Ali. We want to make it so that all of our education, you know, slants towards Ollie. All of our learning should be lifelong. We really are committed to here at, at Dominguez Hills, not just earning degrees, but we have a commitment to you after you earn your degree to make sure you're thriving in life, uh, that we upskill, reskill, support you in your careers. And that's something that really we try and walk the walk. Our motto here on campus and for the university is once a Toro, always a Toro. 
we're trying to embody that by that support. So, so Ollie is a program we're very proud of. I want to thank Dean Kim McNutt and his whole group over there for putting on a stellar program. And it's a commitment we have going forward to the community. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, someone asked about our loaner program, uh, Chris. So I guess they didn't hear you the first time. So come on in and, and wrap on that a little bit. Yeah, the specific question we did see at President Parham was uh, related to uh, incoming transfer students that had not yet had an ID issued to them going through the system. And our system is based on student ID. We will, however, since I'm recognizing now that there may be a few students that have not been issued IDs, be opening that up. And thank you for identifying that uh, gap that we had in the system to get those laptops out to you. But they will be made available to you, and we do have them available for fall semester. If I can say one more word, in addition to the internship programs that both Mike have talked about and our former student here talked about, we also run internal internship programs in IT and other places that give the students firsthand experience with the same softwares that are typically running at Raytheon and other companies because we're all running industry standard equipment in the background. So when they graduate from here, they're ready to hit the ground running as if they've been experienced for a year, two or three person in the workplace. So these are some of the distinctive Dominguez Hills things I think that we have to offer in this vein. So thank you for the time. Yeah, great. And then I wanna uh, finish up uh, I think it was Gil who also raised the issue and thanked us for the 6460 and a lot of you online won't know what that is. So when we come to a university like this that is celebrating to start its 60th anniversary, as we were founded in 1960, and this is 2020, of course, our 60th anniversary, I had to think about what do we want to do that is special and really does tribute to that. And so we have developed and are about to launch uh, more fully. It's kind of quiet now, but we're launching it more fully uh, in the near future, what is called a 6460 campaign. And what we are looking for, for our students, this is really about supporting our students. And I'm reminded of the words of the great Algerian psychiatrist, Franz Fanon, who challenges us that says, each generation out of relative obscurity must reach out and seek to fulfill its legacy or betray it. And so we have been blessed to inherit the legacy that we all do, but we have to be able to give back to the future generations who struggle mightily to try to get access to the opportunities that we have available on the campus. So the 6460 campaign will allow us to try to identify 60 individuals who can provide us with $60,000 each and we want to be able to raise $3.6 million. Now what that does is it provides different increments of scholarship funding for students. Some may be in $2,500 scholarships, some $5,000 scholarships, right? Whatever the increment is, but for every $2,500 scholarship we can provide a student, it takes 10 hours of work off of their backs. And if we can give them back the gift of time and have them focus, it's gonna increase our retention and graduation rates exponentially, and it's gonna help them focus on both the academic and co-curricular learning opportunities there. And if we can endow some of that money to put it aside, it is the gift that keeps on giving, but that is the level of scholarship support that these students deserve and really their economic circumstance demands. And so we're gonna to try to go to work on that particular campaign this fall and hope some of you who know, right, are prepared to give of your bounty or no other people who can, either in businesses or something. We are looking for champions to find us 6460. We want 60 individuals at $60,000 each for $3.6 million. And if I can find 100 individuals who want to do that, I'll be glad to take that. Our students deserve it. Our community deserves it. And we hope you'll get behind us and support it. Uh, Kara, let's go to our last couple of questions. We've got about seven minutes left. Point values are tripled now. Okay. Del Huff. Go ahead. Dale Huff, how are you? I'm wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity just to come forward and to speak this evening. I wanna thank you, Dr. Parham. Actually having been involved with this university for over half of that 60 years, I wanna say how wonderful it is for our community to be able to interact with you personally as you've offered us and come into our living rooms this afternoon. 
I represent Stevenson Village Homeowner Association, uh, many other things. I'm a commissioner, and I am on the foundation board there at the university. Yes. Your forward thinking and the opportunities that you have brought and are bringing to this campus are really magnificent for us. As you stated, we have so many first generation um, students there and most of them or many of them come from right here in our community, as well as being close enough to see the homeless population of students and to see how they are welcomed in and cared for not only here in our community by our different homeowners associations that surround that school and like Dominguez Hills and University Heights. But I thank you so much for the opportunity of working with you. Your forward thinking presents many challenges, <laughs> I will say that, but it is such a wonderful opportunity to be able to serve not only our community, which is not just the community versity as it was known, but uh, it has transformed lives and this community because people can now see firsthand what is going on. You're reachable, and I thank you for that as well. If someone calls, they don't have to feel pushed away or wait days and days on end to get close to you, but I'm enjoying, I'm looking forward to living and seeing the great things that are going to happen and are happening on the campus of Cal California State University, Dominguez Hills. God bless you, and we will do all that we can to support our university right here in the city of Carson. Thank you, Dell, and, and no one has been uh, equally more supportive of this university than you, and we appreciate that. You are certainly one of the community stalwarts, and uh, I'm grateful for you and grateful for welcoming uh, my wife, Davida, and I into the community and the support that you provided and really volunteering and working as part of our foundation as well. So we're grateful for you. Uh, Carl, I wonder if we have a couple of phone calls we'll try to get through, and I'm gonna see if I can spend another few minutes past uh, time to be able to be on the phone because we have such a, a rich, uh, 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 stable of people who are uh, here and wanting to engage us this evening. Okay, we, uh, the next caller is 0244, and uh, you have the floor to be able to talk right now. Uh, yes, 0244 already spoke. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm looking for Charlotte Brimmer. If you can raise your hand, um, I'm gonna go down I apologize, I'm not keeping track of all these numbers. 3080, were you already, you already spoke, right? 3080 might have been uh, Erica. Erica. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm trying to find the numbers. 5387. Hi, yes, um, good evening, everyone. Good evening, introduce yourself. Good evening. Yes, my name is Kyla Washington. I am a proud alumni. Um, I graduated in 2008. And All right. Hi, Kyla. Well, now, well. Hello. Um, I've relocated to the state of Texas. So my question is, um, is there any way that we have a network, um, a community network to connect with people in the outskirts of California? So other states, um, do we have anything already in place or are we looking to maybe uh, commit to something online or um, figure something out that people can connect from outside of the state of California? So the short answer is absolutely. In fact, I travel all around the country and the world, but one of the people I travel with beyond uh, Kalia Bradshaw is this young man, David Gamboa, who I mentioned to you earlier, uh, who also is connected to alumni. So David, you wanna, you wanna uh, uh, relate to that question? Absolutely. There's a variety of different opportunities as we're looking to uh, develop chapters in other states. And so um, please email me at a dgamboa at csudh.edu. That's dgamboa at, CSU, at csudh.edu. We've created chapters, alumni chapters and support groups in the East Coast. We've uh, created alumni chapters and support groups internationally and they keep on getting bigger and bigger. And so the Turtle Nation is strong. Um, not only are we at all 50 states, we're also international as well. So as the university continues to grow, so does our footprint. So I look forward to hearing from you so that from there we can expand to uh, your community. 
Uh, Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, good. And, and welcome and, and be safe there in Texas, uh, certainly. But we've met alums in D.C., alums in New York. I've met alums in London, England, for God's sake, uh, which is, you know, hard to imagine. So if we can do it in London, England, I know we can do it in Texas and get together. So please stay connected to us. Thank you for being with us this evening. Cara, next. Cameron Thurman, thank you for your patience. You are next. Go right ahead. Hello, Cameron. Hi, how are you? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. How are you? Okay, Welcome. Wonderful. wonderful. Um, I am the current cheer coach. I've been at Dominguez for 15 years, and I am an alum. So I hold this university like close to my heart. Um, and I just wanted to say, this is not a complaint, so thank God. Uh, first, I want to say thank you because David Gamboa stays really close, and he keeps us informed on the spirit side. And also, I wanted to just say um, it's important if we um, reach out to some of the students. That's what we've been doing social media-wise, us and dance, um, just trying to keep the campus uplifted. I know it seems like such a small, like, oh, my God, it's just cheer and dance, but Honestly, some of these students are feeling so displaced that they are looking for any way that they can to connect. Um, I feel like my team is bigger than it ever has been. It's, we have 50 kids, uh, which I've never had on a team before. And some of them, um, I did not add them for talent. I added them because they needed a place to belong, and I am here for that. Um, and I, want, I feel like I can find something for everybody to do. I think some of our freshmen felt um, abandoned by their high schools coming into it. And I just welcome them all in. And we do a lot of fun things on social media. So I would encourage our faculty and staff to get involved, um, encourage the students to get involved. Even though we can't meet in person, we are finding in innovative ways to connect with not just our students, but even other cheer teams, other dance teams, um, high school teams that are feeling, you know, they're feeling left out or maybe displaced we're trying to find ways to uplift everybody. So uh, it's great to be a part of the Toro Nation and know that we're here to support the campus, even inside the campus and abroad. So thank you, Cameron, and nice to see you. And um, we've tried to elevate the presence of both dance and cheer on the campus uh, uh, in my tenure here the last couple of years, but let me try to go one better. If you can arrange a Zoom call with my office, so give Bernadine a call. What I'm gonna do is have a personal Zoom call with your dance and cheer folk. And so they can come and just say hello to President and let me see if I can't connect them to the campus, particularly for those folk who I've not had the pleasure of meeting yet, particularly if they're new uh, freshmen and transfers, as well as those continuing students who you do such a great job of nurturing and supporting. So please make sure you get to uh, Deborah Robertson there who you see, or to Tony Little, or to uh, Bernadine Grayer in my office and they'll make sure they hook it up, and I'll be glad to, to meet with the students myself. Cara, oh, let, we got time for a couple more questions. Here we go. Okay, so Nicole Picotta has uh, her hand up, but she also has a question that I'm going to read out loud, um, and she may have more than that. Uh, the question, oh, and she lowered <laughs> her hand. Okay, so the, the question is, um, I noticed Ask Teddy. Can you touch on that a little bit? Oh, see Chris Manriquez smiling right there. Go ahead, <laughs> Vice President Manriquez. So one of the latest endeavors we have in technology really across the entire campus is working with our student affairs folks and academic affairs folks and developing an AI engine. Okay, and AI is obviously an autonomous response. So you're gonna be able to use voice recognition through your phone, through applications to ask questions and have it respond to what students have identified as first time freshmen on our campus, what the top inquiries were for services. Look to us to expand that more broadly over the coming months as we add services that were high impact through the COVID circumstance to that service as well. So it will be more broad ranging across the entire university. So that is an AI application that we do have available and we're expanding it out. The first wave will be a chat type function where it's simply asking questions and receiving response. The, fo the following iterations will move to pointing you directly at services. So if you ask questions related to financial aid, it will point you at those areas and give you the information to begin to initiate those processes. So this is some of the more forward leaning applications that we're working on at Dominguez Hills. Thank you for asking the question. And yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we got time for another question. Cara, go for it. You know, uh, all the questions have been answered and I don't okay. see any 
hands. So here's one last opportunity. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like to share, please take a moment to raise your hand so that we can see you and allow you to ask your question. If not, well, there we go. All right, Constance Jackson, you're on. Go ahead. Hi, Constance. Hi, hi, doctor. Uh, thank you so much for your, your efforts and leading uh, this whole effort in the, what I call, in, in, in times of, as you mentioned, you know, Black Lives Matter, but in times of frustration, um, the, the feeling of not being seen or appreciated as a Black person, as a Black woman, um, and I'm a little bit concerned as a businesswoman that entrepreneurship is really being ignored within the, the campus community. And I understand we have an entrepreneurial program. I'm on the advisory board for CBAP. Um, and I think you sort of mentioned a little bit about the women's studies program, but that doesn't really fall within what we can do to empower black women and brown women, women of color, um, to achieve what they, they would like to achieve in, in business. Is there any way that we can foster a women's entrepreneurial initiative or, you know, or program within the school um, at all? Or is this something that um, should stay within the realm of what we have now, the entrepreneurial program? So I'm specifically asking, can we, you know, niche entrepreneurship for community outreach as well for, for, for brown and black women to achieve excellence in business? Well, fortunately, in fact, and I'll, I'll rely on both uh, of the provost and Chris may want to weigh in on this, but um, we are already halfway home because 70% of our student body, literally 70%, are in fact brown and black women. So we're halfway home there, and certainly as we want to engage the broader community, I think that's there. One of the things that universities are known for is their ability to, to innovate and create and discover. And so there's almost no idea, I think, that you can think of that we can't find a way to get it done. The challenge for us, of course, being a resource constrained environment is making sure that we have the resources necessary to be able to do that. And how do we deploy resources strategically to make sure that we can meet those needs. Um, and sometimes the resources are not simply financial, but are also personnel. Sometimes they're faculty related, sometimes they're staff related, you know, even student assistants that I think that we have to be able to do that. But there are always possibilities that we can look forward to being able to do that. Uh, I want to also just empathize with you as uh, an African-American woman and thinking about being a business owner because those businesses in particular in the midst of COVID and even in the midst of the racial challenges that we're experiencing now in the country have been the hardest hit. And I was looking at some data the other day on both CNN and C uh, MSNBC where they were talking about the, the uh, desperate impact that it is having on those particular businesses. So. Uh, what we'll do is put that in the bailiwick of our uh, entrepreneur center and our uh, provost and academic affairs and see what we can't do about that. So let me see if both the provost wants to weigh in, Chris Manriquez, and then David Gamboa may have something too. So Mr. Provost, anything additional on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, exactly what Constance is asking for is we've been on this path for the last six months to exactly do what she's asking. Uh, and so I'm going to have Chris talk a little bit about our search for an executive director to kind of steer us in this direction. And also, uh, Vice President Manriquez and I purposely went to Oregon State University about four months ago to go and study what they had been doing there to really expand their, their commitment to entrepreneurship. We were cited in our WASC 10-year gold review for reaccreditation as having an entrepreneurial spirit. But to Constance's point, we need to go further and we really need to support those women in the community. They really should have that ability to be able to start their businesses and be supported. We also are committed that every student that graduates from Dominguez Hills should have this as a fundamental skill. 
Uh, many of our graduates are going to go through three or four or five or seven career paths. We want them to be entrepreneurial to be able to do that kind of work. I'll turn it over to Chris. Chris? Excellent. Well, thank you for asking the question. Uh, one of the things that sadly our COVID circumstance has gotten kind of slowed both Mike and I down with is this specific activity. At this point in time, we do have an innovation incubator founded on some of the foundational work that Dr. Gary Polk has put in to begin that. And we've taken that and begun to elevate it and move it certain directions on the campus. One of those directions is we're going to be moving it from information technology directly into academic affairs, specifically for that bridging into academic programmatic, programmatic work. And that kind of focus has both leanings out into the entrepreneurial business side as well as inside our own academic house. So looking at both of those aspects informed by what's been done in Oregon State, we're looking to move that on the campus. Very shortly, you'll see um, advertising or messaging going out to constituent groups on campus about the hiring of a new executive director for the campus for the finalized interviews. We have three finalists that are going to be uh, Zooming, let's, let's call it that, Zooming to the campus as well as probably taking a visit to the campus within six feet of whoever they visit to see what the campus is over the coming month. So you'll see that come out as an additional investment we're making into this and moving forward what we're doing with that. So thank you very much for asking the question and we, we're taking some major steps forward here. In addition, and just kind of wanted to quickly just uh, chime in, actually, uh, Dr. Jennifer uh, Broadman within the College of Business Administration and Public Policy, she's actually putting together a, a group, a mentorship group with uh, a women small business owners. And actually this Thursday, uh, she's gonna be uh, hosting a, a mentoring panel discussion uh, with a variety of different uh, uh, women business leaders as she's trying to develop a mentorship program for students. So what I can do is um, um, I can uh, email you with that information for that panel discussion on Friday, but connect you directly with uh, Dr. Broadman, uh, who is a part of our CBAP faculty, is also um, um, uh, involved with our South Bay Economic Institute. So I can also connect you to her as well. She's doing a lot within that arena of connecting small business um, uh, owners, specifically women business owners, minority business uh, um, owners, um, into a, a, a program to, to enhance that uh, capability. Yeah, good, thank you, David. Um, as we think about, Carol, you got anything else in the queue? No, thank you for asking, okay. just taking yeah. a look. Thank uh, you. Actually, Constance has her head, hand back up again. One moment, please. Go ahead. Constance, go ahead. Yes, I wanted to follow up with you on that. Um, I am a part of Jennifer's um, program. Great. I'm working with her on that. But my question to you gentlemen um, is, um, do you have black women or Hispanic women working with you um, to assess the person you're gonna bring in as an executive director? for the on Trump um, for your innovative um, center. Do you have any feedback from people of color, uh, women of color? I don't, I'm not able to answer that because I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, uh, Chris, almost Chris to answer that, we actually have a board member, Chris. Right. Correct. Almost every search we do has a, a, a variety of people on it that are about as diverse as you can name across uh, race, gender, et cetera. So I'd be surprised if there weren't, but I'm not able to answer for you exactly who is on that particular search committee given the number of search committees that we have going on right now. One of the individuals that we have, uh, her name is slipping, but I'm happy to provide the name for you later. That actually is a member of the board that does work with us on the search is an African-American female. Um, she is actually heads some of the, I can't remember the, uh, group in LA, but brings together innovative uh, youth programs. So I'll go ahead and get that information out to you, but thank you for asking. Yeah, thank you, Constance, for that answer, but I'll also find out the answer myself. I need to know that, so thank you for asking. Uh, I wanna have, you, uh, have a chance before we sign off and begin to thank folk uh, to have you hear from Kalia Bradshaw. Where did I see Kalia at? There you are. Uh, Clea, can we unmute her mic? Say hello to the people, Clea, and tell them a little bit about what you do and your role here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kalia Bradshaw. I work 
in the Office of Government and Community Relations, which is in the Division of University Advancement. So part of my job is managing the university's partnerships with our community stakeholders and a lot of the community organizations that we work with in the South Bay area and abroad. So um, I report to David Gamboa, which is down below my square. Um, I'm also a two-time alumna from CSUDH. I got my bachelor's there and my master's there and uh, just finished my EDD program at Cal State Long Beach. So I'm a product, very proud product of the CSU um, and uh, love my, my state education very much. So happy to work at my alma mater and also very proud to be a product of the CSU system. So glad, thank you, Kalia, for doing that. Also, um, my chief of staff, Deborah Robertson, you wanna uh, uh, say a few words to the community? I just want to say that um, the community should feel confident that there's a team of um, individuals at Dominguez Hills that cares deeply about the students and the success of the, the campus and the city of Carson and surrounding communities. And I think that um, in this pandemic environment and with um, just the current state of affairs, it's brought a lot of us um, together and really highlighted a lot of the issues that we already knew were really critical for the university, but have propelled us to really focus on them and move forward. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you for weighing in. Uh, I want to, uh, Mr. Provost, I see your hand. Yes, sir. Just wanted to uh, make sure Constance got that information. It's uh, Ms. Kimberly Small, who is the Senior Regional Director for NIFTI, Los Angeles Metro. And she's been working with us now for quite a while and has been very involved in working with K-12 programs moving into college. So he she was the person we were mentioning earlier. Yeah, thank good. You. Thank you for that. Um, I want to... Uh, begin to close this town hall. We're about 15, 18 minutes over, but that's okay because we, we don't have enough opportunity to be able to connect with you as a community. But I want to express my sincere thanks and appreciation to everybody who joined us and taking your time to uh, connect with us online or by phone tonight. Um, <clears throat> trying to fulfill a promise I made to you about being a transparent leader is a commitment and obligation I take very seriously. But I really wanna reinforce the fact that uh, I can do nothing in this role, literally nothing, without the support of this team that you see around me on these images and pictures. They're a fabulous group of folk uh, who you've met tonight and know that they are working hard, right, on all of our behalf to be able to make a difference. And we represent, I think, the diversity um, that you can expect here on campus and also the diversity of ideas, I think, that allow us to innovate and create and to do things that really push boundaries and try to take this university to new levels. And so I wanna say thank you to them. Also, we could not do these virtual town halls as we're getting a little bit better at doing them now without support from a couple of people. So I want to say thank you to Guillermo Blanco, uh, who does our PowerPoints and technology support. I wanna say thank you to Fidel Garcia. Uh, Fidel, say hello to the folk. Hello, thank you. And I want to say thank you to him for uh, his support. And Cara Furman, who serves as our host and MC, I want to give big ups to her and say thank you to Cara. So Cara, we appreciate you uh, in serving in that role as well. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I want to make sure, like I say, that you have a chance to, several of you I see have uh, joined, new folk have joined late, you might have missed intros. So I want to make sure I do one last round of people just so you know who the players are who really make up this fabulous team that are here on campus. And I can't get to everybody, but we're gonna to get to a few folk. So let me start with, uh, first of all, our uh, external relations staff. So uh, Kalia, one more time, introduce yourself. That's Kalia Bradshaw, Associate Director, External and Community Relations. Good, David Gamboa. Uh, David Gamboa, Associate Vice President of External Relations. Feel free to reach out to me at a D Gamboa, D G A M B O A at CSUDH.edu or by phone 310-243-3819. And my illustrious Chief of Staff, Deborah Robertson. Deborah Robertson, Chief of Staff. <laughs> nice to see you. And uh, our uh, tech guru, Vice President Manriquez. 
Chris Manriquez, C. Manriquez at CSUDH. And our newest member of the team uh, permanently, it is our uh, chief financial officer and woman who manages the purse strings on campus, but she's also our vice president for admin and finance, that's Deborah Wallace. You all have a good evening, and I'm D. Wallace at csudh.edu. And the man that makes everything student-related tick, uh, and that is our, uh, our secret weapon. Uh, not a secret no more, because he's a bad boy known all over the country. This is Vice President William Franklin. It was a delightful evening. Thank you all for joining us. W. Franklin at csudh.edu. Have a great evening. Stay safe. I want to give a shout out, uh, uh, second to last, to uh, my senior executive assistant, who does your person's work behind the scene, uh, but is oftentimes unseen. I want to make sure we give him some love. Uh, a lot of you won't know who he is, but we know who he is because he runs stuff for us, and that is uh, Tony Little. Tony, say hello to the people. Good evening, everyone. Really enjoyed participating. Have a good evening. Good, good. Our chief academic officer is, we call him Spag, he's Philadelphia Zone, but he is a bad boy. I'm so glad to have him as our chief academic officer and our provost. He is the number two man uh, in command of this university. That is our provost, Michael Spagna. Go Toros. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. You reach me at mspagna at csudh.edu. And I see uh, Mishan. I just saw your picture there flopping up. Uh, you want to say hello to the people who will say hello to them? And you're still on mute, Mishan. Thank you for the opportunity to join. It's a, a blessing to be a part of this campus and to have the leadership um, from the president to David Gamboa and, um, and our entire team. Good. And that's Mishan Montgomery. So on behalf of this entire team, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you again for being with us. I want to close as I'm reminded of the words of the great American poet Langston Hughes, who reminds us that we should hold fast to dreams, for if they die, life is just a broken winged bird that cannot fly. With the racial strife, the tensions that are going on in the country right now, there are a lot of wings that are broken. There are some more that are breaking. But if we hold fast to dreams, right, what they should do is we want to be in the business of mending wings that are broken and preventing as many as we can from breaking. That is what we do here at California State University, Dominguez Hill. We are literally transforming lives that later will transform America. On behalf of our illustrious faculty, our magnificent staff, the 17,000 plus students at this wonderful campus, our senior administrators, and this entire alumni nation of Toro community. I'm Dr. Thomas Parham. I wanna say thank you again for joining us. It's a pleasure to have been with you and thank you for lending us your time and support. Take care, God bless, stay healthy.